Welcome to the Northbound Wealth Podcast. All opinions expressed by me, my co-hosts, or my guests are solely our own opinions and do not reflect the opinions of Northbound Wealth Management, LLC. This podcast is for informational and educational purposes only and should not be relied upon for any investment, tax, or legal advice, or as a solicitation to offer or buy any securities. Clients of Northbound Wealth Management, LLC may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. Hey, everybody, this is Brent Foster, Northbound Wealth Management founder and CEO. Today is April 10th, 2023. This is week 37 of the Weekly Market Insights podcast, Um, Northbound Wealth Management. Hey, here we go. So last week, stocks ended a shortened week of trading mixed amid revived recession fears on Wall Street triggered by weak economic data. The Dow Jones Industrial Average gained 0.63%, while the Standard & Poor's 500 slipped 0.10%. The NASDAQ Composite Index lost 1.10% for the week, and the MSCI EFA Index, which tracks developed overseas stock markets, advanced 0.37%. So what does that mean for the Dow? The Dow closed at 33,485. Year to date, that's up 1.02%. The NASDAQ closed at 12,087. That's up 15.49%, by far the best uh, index this year. MSCI EFA index uh, closed at 2,100. That's up 8.05% for the year. S&P 500 closed at 4,105. That is up 6.92% for the year. The 10 year Treasury note did decline. Uh, a little bit, but it closed at 3.30%. That's uh, flat on the year, down just a little bit by 0.58%. So recession fears resurface. Uh, I don't think they resurface necessarily. Uh, I think they're just there always haunting every person. Just kidding, guys. Um, Renewed recession worries dented investor sentiment. And uh, the week kicked off with a weekend announcement by OPEC Plus, not to be confused with some fancy way of saying Disney Plus. They they have an intention to cut oil production. Oh, they did by a million barrels a day, which is going to raise prices here in the U.S. for all of us Main Streeters who uh, care about gas prices and actually drive around. And then you've got the Fed, which is now trying to fight inflation. Well, this actually fights the Fed. The prospect for higher oil prices not only revived inflation fears, possibly hurting the chances of a rate hike paused by the Fed, but it raised concerns over future consumer spending. Stocks weathered the news well, but uh, buckled on weak manufacturing and services data in subsequent days. Stocks trended lower again after a lower than expected uh, open jobs number and a slowdown in private sector hiring. Stocks stabilized to close on Thursday, despite an increase in jobless claims and a pickup in March layoffs. The cooling labor market is also uh, what we're going to dive into. So a string of labor reports last week reflected signs of a cooling labor market, beginning with an unexpected and significant decline in the number of open jobs, which falling below 10 million for the first time in nearly two years. The JOLTS report it precedes the payroll processor ADP's employment report that saw a rise in private sector hiring of 145,000, but that's short of the consensus forecast of 210,000 and uh, and smaller wage gains in that in those numbers. So after reports of a jump in initial jobless claims on Thursday and a 15% rise in layoffs in March, Friday's March employment report showed the smallest increase in non-farm payrolls of up about 236,000 since December of 2020. So this week, key economic data, Wednesday, consumer price index, CPI number, FOMC minutes, Uh, Thursday, jobless claims, producer price index, Friday, retail sales, industrial production, consumer sentiment survey. And then you've got notable companies reporting earnings. You've got Delta Airlines on Thursday. And on Friday, you've got JP Morgan Chase, BlackRock, United Health Group, Citigroup, the PNC Financial Services Group. And that kind of kicks off Q2 earnings. And they're going to be reporting on how Q1 went. So we'll all be paying attention to that. So dive into this next little segment, how to choose a tax preparer, given that we all have to file our taxes between now 
and April 15th, or you file an extension, do your thing or whatever. But the deadline is, is here. Uh, boy, that went fast. 2023 is just screaming uh, in time and velocity. Uh, it's essential to choose a tax preparer that is suitable for your needs, as well as reliable and ethical. After all, taxpayers are responsible for the information uh, on their return, regardless of who prepared it. Here are some tips from the IRS on how to choose a tax preparer who meets your needs. Check the IRS directory of federal tax return preparers. Check the preparer's history with the Better Business Bureau. Ask about fees. Ask if the preparer plans to use uh, e-file. Make sure the preparer is available. Ensure the preparer signs and includes their prepare tax identification number, and then finally understand the preparer's credentials. Choosing a reputable and reliable tax preparer can help protect you and your tax return. This information is not intended to be a substitute for specific individualized tax advice. We suggest you discuss your specific tax issues with a qualified tax professional. And this tip was adapted from irs.gov. On to the next segment. Hey, everybody. It's been a little while since I've given a technical analysis spotlight. So here we go. So I just want to dive into the S&P 500. uh, And as of this recording, which is um, uh, Wednesday, April 12th, looks like the uh, S&P 500 is trading at about 4,117 and change. Uh, It's nearly noon on Wednesday, the 12th. We've got the um, five-day moving average at 4,103, so slightly uh, we're trading above the five-day moving average. We're trading above uh, the 20-day moving average, which is 4,023. The 50-day moving average is 4,032. The 100-day moving average is 3,987. And the 200-day moving average is 3,947. And uh, year-to-date average is around 4,010. So um, uh, I'm checking my monitors, my screens and things, all of my data sets that I look at uh, midday on a trading day. And I thought I'd drop this in to you, some a little bit of work that I've done. And um, what I'm looking at here is... Uh, we've we've got a short squeeze, a bit of a rally coming on to the, the beginning of this year. Um, basically, there's a large confluence of support of like systematic trading that would happen if the market were to sell down from 4,100 to the 4,200 level. Right now we're trading again, I'll remind you, 4,114. So we're kind of near the ceiling of what I see happening uh, in the first half of this year uh, for, for, from a chart perspective. So maybe we have a ceiling at 4,200. I don't see us extending and breaking out above that. I see us kind of hitting and butting up against that ceiling and then rolling back over and selling back down to potentially test, uh, last year's late last year's lows of 3,500. I don't, I'm not entirely confident right now that we'll actually get down to those levels, but we could, if we break 4,000, we could have an additional selling, uh, systematic selling that happens. And then the next gap down is around 3750 or 3749, somewhere in there. So if we're going to, if we're potentially going to be selling down, it's not a bad idea. Um, if you are more of a trader, um, to take some gains off the table, I'm speaking to mostly clients, uh, and, and folks that are long-term investors, long only investors who aren't traders. And so we might make some tactical asset allocation adjustments, um, as we're kind of butting up and not showing a, a lot of, of a catalyst to be breaking out, uh, out above that. Um, it, it wouldn't be beyond markets to, to do that, but then to fail breaking out above the 4,200, levels and then trading down and then trying to find a base somewhere around 4,000. But if that breaks, it goes, we gap down. Like I said, we could potentially see 4,311 or 4,277 above the 
4,200 level, like I just mentioned, we could break out above that, but uh, the probabilities are in the favor of a correction or a consolidation here rather than a breakout. Um, as you see, uh, inflation still is trending lower. The rate of change is trending lower. I'm not going to get into the details of all of it, but uh, OPEC plus just uh, cut production, which is going to increase energy uh, costs to all of us, which is inflationary. And the Fed is still um, looking at potentially raising rates. Maybe again, the minutes come out today in the next two hours. Um, so what I say here may change. Well, I it probably will because who knows what the minutes actually say because there is sometimes a disconnect between what Jay Powell says in a meeting and then what actually is said inside of a closed door session meeting in the meeting minutes that come out later that are parsed and analyzed by everyone under the sun. Uh, and then trades are made based on what, what comes out through those Fed meeting minutes. So um, that's exciting stuff. The market's kind of at an interesting uh, segue here as we approach tax season, as we approach the, the debt ceiling that might be coming up here soon. Um, well, probably is. It'll be a political football punting back and forth. Uh, between Democrats and Republicans on that. So they'll hold the, the country's credit hostage, probably, which doesn't surprise anyone these days with our political environment. Um, the banking sector, as it relates to banks, um, I'm not too concerned about what's going on there. There are bankers and banks out there that are mismanaged and misrun. Um, there are other banks that are run really well. So um if you're going to be an investor, invest in the banks that are good. I, I've got, I've received quite a few calls and questions about the banking sector and the fear of where your money's held. Well, if it's held at one of the larger money center banks uh, that are too big to fail, then I don't think you have anything to worry about. It's some of these smaller banks that uh, maybe got over their skis or mismanaged their book of business that are getting uh, pinched just by the economic environment and not being uh, nimble enough or flexible enough to uh, manage through this rate cycle that we're in. And it was telegraphed, so I don't feel too bad for them. They kind of deserve to fail. Uh, unfortunately, it hurts everybody locally, which I, I don't want to see that. But I don't also think that we should also be on the hook for bailing all these banks out if they're failing, um, small ones, that is. Uh, the larger institutions will be fine. Um, I think everybody's going to uh, calmer heads prevail is kind of my thinking around this. I think people are going to make wise decisions, uh, whether that's government regulators uh, or uh, market participants and things like that. <clears throat> we could see that the banking sector could go through a bit of a consolidation where some of the larger banks become larger through mergers and acquisitions, like what's kind of happening. So um, I think that it's not as a, as a systemic of a, a concern um, as some people say in the media. Our investment firm custodies investment assets at Charles Schwab. I have no concerns about Charles Schwab and their financial stability and how they handle things. I think they're going to do great and probably come out of this uh, even better and stronger than they were heading into this little mini crisis that we have in the banking sector. So I've got the S&P 500. I've got uh, a Fibonacci retracement line snapped at the bottom of March of 2020, all the way up to, um, let's see, what is that? That is, oh, the highs in 2022. And it looks like the October lows, October lows of last year, December lows of last year, uh, mark a 50% retracement. That's right at 3,500. The market like literally went down to that marker and then stopped and then reverse course all the way back up to 4,119 where we're trading right now today on April 12th. So the bottom of... Uh, 2020 was right around 2,180 on the S&P 500. We rallied all the way up to about 4,800 uh, on the S&P in, uh, in the early part of 2022. And then to, as everybody understands and knows, 
2022 was a, a, a really challenging, hard market to be in. Uh, we had a retracement of that all the way down to 3,500. So 2180, bottom of March 2020, the pandemic, all the way up to 4,800, and then a retracement of that by 50% to 3,500. And then we're up to about 4,100 to 4,200. And that's the, <clears throat> if you have a, if you're into charting, that's uh, 4179 is the 23.6 percent retracement of of that entire move. So um, it's it's interesting to see exactly where we're trading at, and it's not out of the normal to see a retracement of this previous move that we had from 3500 to 4200, and a retest of those lows. So we'll see what happens here over the coming months, but. Um, I'm not the only one that thinks this. JP Morgan also thinks uh, that the 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 ceiling on the market right now is 4,200 and and could press into 4,311. So you could see an extension of that, um, but uh, but then that would be kind of the the, the higher level in uh, the the highs being put in for the first part of 2023, and then we'll have to see what happens in the second half of 2023 as uh, the Fed is really faced with some serious decisions about rates and uh, and uh, politicians and economists are all serious about what's going on. So uh, stay tuned for more updates on the technicals and more comments from Brent Foster here at Northbound Wealth Management, trying to put complex stuff into layman's terms so that we don't just glaze over and turn off this podcast. All right, you guys have a great week. I'll talk to you next week. And uh, I'm excited about what's coming. Take care.